Good evening, and welcome to our meets Netflix and novels and film, ad film adaptations featuring The Queen's Gambit, where Bev will discuss the novel by Walter Tevis and the Netflix adaptation that has been rated the number one Netflix series of 2020. My name is Robbie Prostein. I'm the Mid-Atlantic and New England Regional Director, and I thank you for coming out this evening. I'd like to extend my gratitude to Bev Rosen, our keynote speaker, and my colleague, Sarah Blyer, Development Associate and New Gen Team Leader, who will lead a lively Q&A. A special thank you to Israela Khan, who did all the graphics for the presentation. Please enter your comments and questions in the chat box during the presentation. Bev will respond to your comments after her presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Sandra Dunkelberger, our new board member, who serves on the Philadelphia Council Shira Chapter Board. Sandra will share an update, a meet update with you. Good evening and welcome. I am Sandra and I became active in Amit after learning about Amit's commitment to raising the educational bar for all of its students. With better education comes better opportunity and that's something that I tried to instill in my own children and two of them ended up being educators themselves. Uh, I, I'd just like to take a moment and share a bit about Amit and one of the ways that Amit relates to the Queen's Gambit. At, uh, Amit educates over 41,000 students in Israel. Approximately 70% come from very disadvantaged backgrounds. Amit schools place a heavy emphasis on finding ways to close that opportunity gap so that disadvantaged students do not lack anything, not even a family structure and healthy ho home environment. We deliver a 21st century academically excellent education, always keeping Jewish values at the forefront of everything that we do. We are proud as we move into the future. Beth, the main character of the, the Queen's Gambit was an orphan living in an orphanage. And within the Amit network, we have two residential facilities though we do not call them orphanages at this time. <laughs> the Amit Kafar Blat Youth Village is home to over 500 teenagers who would otherwise grow up lacking most of life's basics. Without Amit, they have no supportive family, they lack structure, regular meals, healthy role models, uh, and it Kafar Blat, our teens live in warm family-like units with surrogate parents and they receive the care and attention that are, that are imperative to their physical and psychological development. Amit Frisch Beit Hayeled in Jerusalem is a very special place where young children are well cared for and loved. Beit Hayeled cares for the, the city's most at-risk children for, um, from severely abusive and neglectful families. At Beit Hayeled, these children live together in warm family-like units. And in both facilities, it is those family-like units that are the key. Our students live with a young couple who have their own children. At the beginning of this school year, our schools were open after being shut down and then shut down again. However, our schools all transitioned seamlessly to distance learning. We, we lent thousands of computers to our most disadvantaged students who were not equipped it for, um, for the at-home learning our staff made tens of thousands of home visits to check on the, the students' well being, and approximately 100 children and teenagers remained with our surrogate families even when the schools had to close. And so now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Bev Rosen. 
Bev is a popular book, film, and theater reviewer. She has taught in Philadelphia area colleges and suburban adult education programs. Bev facilitates book groups in person as well as online, and we hope that you enjoy the program. Take it away. Thank you, Sandra. Good evening and welcome everybody. Thank you for supporting Amit and for joining us this season, this evening, this evening to discuss Netflix's most popular series, The Queen's Gambit. And what I would like to try to share with you this evening is the book on which the series is based and how the book and the written word is then adapted to the small screen. And it is said that uh, the Queen's Gambit has done more for chess than Julia Child has done for the art of Jewish cooking. That over 62 million households tuned in to the series during the first 28 days, that it was the number one to 10, the top 10 in 92 countries, the number one series in 63 countries, and that the uh, Chess Foundation has said that this show is seducing men and women, girls and boys to play chess. In fact, they cannot keep chess boards and chess sets in stock, whether it's Amazon or it's eBay or it's stores. So we're going to explore this evening why that is the case. And this is the way I would like to explore it with you. I want to talk about the book on which the series is based. It is The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis. And I'd like to share a little bit about the author's life and how his experiences have shaped um, his novel. Walter Tevis was born in San Francisco in 1928. He is an, a noted author. Three of his works have been translated into film and adapted into film. The Color of Money, The Hustler, and The Man Who Fell uh, uh, from the Sky. He himself wrestled with addiction. He writes that as a young boy, he had a heart problem and he was left by his family in a, in a facility that would treat him when they moved to um, Kentucky. And he was given painkillers and, med and um, medicine that addicted him in his youth. And he believes that that addiction led to alcoholism later in his life. He was an amateur chess player. He did live in, uh, when he moved from California to Lexington, he was a fish out of water. He was bullied in school. He was seen as a nerd. He had no friends. He was the odd person out, just like Beth. He says that chess helped him uh, mitigate his uh, addictions. And when he wrote this book, it came out in 1983. He would die a year later at, at, at 56. And 37 years later, Netflix production has put this book on the New York Times bestseller list. The interesting thing is he has two children. He had two marriages. He has two children. They are alive and well, and they have the rights to their father's work, and they're very happy. But more than that, they said that uh, Walter Tevis, that their father, would have been delighted because he loved to be in the spotlight. He loved to be a celebrity. But most of all, he really loved chess. And moreover, he loved his characters. And I think you can see that particularly Beth, he loved Beth. And he said in an interview, I am dedicating this novel to a very brainy woman who is brave, who is coming of age, who will be able to overcome her demons and uh, to live a full life. She will not only be the queen of the chess world, she'll be the queen of her uh, self. And then this book went to sleep for over 30 years. It was optioned twice. And I think this is interesting. Heath Ledger, 
wanted to put this on film, the, the Queen's Gambit by Tevis. And unfortunately, in 2008, he died himself. And um, it was never made into a, a, a film. And then Scott Frank found it along with Alan Scott. And they said, we're going to sell this idea to Netflix. We see it as a series. And then somebody said, how can you sell a compelling idea about chess and playing chess? What about the people who never play chess, who don't even understand the rules of chess? And they said, this book is not about chess. And those who have read it and have seen the series knows that this is about life. This is a coming of age story of a young girl who's left as an orphan, Beth Harmon, whose odyssey will uh, take her and allow her to grow and to find herself and to bring out themes that Walter Tevis wanted to bring out. Some of them are, um, if genius also leads to madness, like Beth's mother in a way, of feminism, of racism, of addiction, of loss, of agency. It is all played out in the novel and it is brought to the, to the Netflix series. And so chess becomes a metaphor, not only for the game on 64 black and white squares, it becomes the metaphor for life and for triumphing over loss, uh, addiction, and finding one's self. And it's done in a fascinating way. So I just want to talk a little bit about the novel, the plot, and the characters. And I must say that the series adaptation is very true in most parts to the, to the novel, and you will see. That it differentiates itself in, in, in three main ways. What would talk about the series. So the book, the novel opens with a nine-year-old Beth Harmon being told by a woman with a, um, a board saying a clipboard, your mother was killed in an accident and you are now uh, uh, alone in this world and we are taking you to the Methune uh, orphanage um, in Kentucky where you will be well taken care of. And we are introduced to nine-year-old Beth Harmon, who um, is at a loss. You know, she's traumatized by the loss of her mother. We don't know what has happened by a father. And she's stripped of her identity in the orphanage. They take off her little sleeveless dress that has Beth on it and, and give, her, gives her, give her the uniform that makes her identical like all the other little girls in, in the uh, orphanage. It is there that she'll meet Jolene, who's African-American, five years older than she, who will explore the idea of racism and they will become friends for life. And most importantly, she will find Mr. Shable, who William Shable, who is the janitor in the orphanage, who will teach her the game of chess. He becomes a surrogate father figure all the way through the novel and the series. He it seems gruff, but he is teaching her not only chess, but about life. And so he talks to her about sportsmanship. He talks to her about mitigating her anger. He allows her to understand that when she curses, she's going to pay a price. She opens the world to her in the high school where she plays all of the boys because it's very much a male dominated world. Um, and gives her the confidence when she says to him in the novel, as she does in the series, am I good enough? He says to her, my dear, you are amazing. And so it's the first time that she feels some sense of pride and that somebody cares about her. And she understands that her mother's math abilities and genius has come to her and she have, will be a child prodigy in terms of the chess world. It is also where she's introduced to addiction. It is true that in the 50s and 60s, where this novel is set, that children in 
Group homes and orphanages were given tranquilizers, what Jolene calls special vitamins, along with vitamins, in order to keep them calm. And uh, Beth, at an early age, becomes addicted to uh, these um, special vitamins, and that leads later on to all her other addictions. She also has the ability to vision games of chess in her head. So we find her throughout the novel looking up on the ceiling and seeing upside down um, Mr. Shable's chessboard. And every time through the series where you will see the chessboard, it is his original chess set. Um, they now think they will be adopted. Neither uh, she nor Jolene won because Jolene is older and black. And uh, because uh, at the age of 13, they don't think anyone is going to adopt um, Beth Harmon either. But in come the introduction of the Wheatleys. Alma Wheatley, who is looking for an older child. And you'll say to yourself, why? Because she is looking for um, a, a, a companion. Her husband does not care for her. He's away on business all the time. And she's truly looking for a companion. Mrs. Deardoff says that Beth, she makes her younger than she really is, is bright in school. She is uh, um, helpful and she would be an optimal adoptee. And so she will leave Jolene and then mysteriously a book disappears called Modern Chess Openings. And we don't know who took it, but we find out later it is Jolene. She is angry that her best friend is being taken away and she is left um, in, the, in the orphanage. When Beth goes to Lexington, Kentucky with the Wheatleys, her life opens up in many ways, darkness into light. And when she walks into her room and says, is this all for me? Is this all mine? And um, Alma Wheatley says, yes. Alma's an interesting character. She's disappointed in many ways. She has the loss of a child herself. She wanted to be a pianist, and we listen to the Eric Satie music that she plays in, in the series. She knows that her husband does not care for her. She is a woman addicted herself. The same pills that um, Beth in the orphanage once breaks into the apothecary for, the, um, the green and and be beige pills and watch how they're translated into costumes that Alma is taking herself. Alma also drinks too much and alienates her husband. When she, the two women, both the adopted daughter and Alma are deserted by the husband, um, it allows Beth to say, I can win chess tournaments. I will be able to bring the purses home. In this way, I'll be able to, to uh, give back, if you were, or I can begin to earn uh, some of our um, monies that we need for the house, because money is always a problem. So when she's sent to the pharmacy in, in Lexington, she will steal at first the chess review. She sees that there is um, a tournament being played in the Kentucky for the state championship, and she needs $5. Who does she turn to? She turns to William Schabel and asks for the money and he provides it. And he's in her mind, literally and figuratively, throughout the novel and throughout the series. She will win um, the tournament, much to Harry Belchick's uh, disappointment, and that launches her and her adopted mother. You may think because Alma's not a very good role model, she introduces uh, liquor uh, to, uh, uh, to Beth, who will later have alcoholism, uh, alcoholism as part of her problem, but she really does care. And at one point in the novel, she said, I may not be a housewife anymore, but I can try to be a mother. And I think she does try uh, to do that. We will follow um, Beth and uh, Alma 
to major tournaments. We will go to Cincinnati, we will go to Mexico, we will go to Paris, and ultimately we will go to Moscow. She wins some, she loses some. When she wins, she's elated and can also um, lord it over a young Russian chess player who's only 13 years old, who she meets in, um, in, in Mexico. She also has three men in her life. When she first plays um, a first tournament, she meets um, D.L. Towns, who is this handsome young man, and she, he is her unrequited love. He appears twice in the novel not at the end. In the series, he comes in three times, and she hopes that maybe there will be a liaison, but there's not because he, his, his sexual preference is, is men, and she doesn't know it at the time. Harry Belchick, who is one of her competitors, will come and coach her when she's in Lexington and play a part at the end. And then we have Benny Watts. And Benny Watts is an outsider, just the way Beth is an outsider. And how do we know? Look at his costume. He's like a modern day Huckleberry Finn. He has a hat, he has a long coat, and he has a knife. And when Beth says to him, why are you, why do you dress this way? Why are you carrying a knife? And um, he says, for protection. He will become a, cat a, a competitor, a lover of sorts, and then um, a coach. And so Alma in Mexico has a pen pal. <laughs> His name is Manuel, and he will wine and dine her in uh, Mexico. She, um, uh, Meth will lose her match to Borgoff, her first match in, in Mexico. And when she comes back, um, at one point, Alma's disappointed because she's left again. But when she comes back from the match with um, Bor uh, Borgoff, Alma has died. And Beth is very sad. There is a mother-daughter connection. She looks at her watch because watch how time, the symbol of time, it clicks not only through the clock of the chess game, but also the time that passes in, uh, in Beth and Alma's life in the characters of the novel. Um, she calls Mr. Alston, who doesn't even want to be a surrogate father, and he says to her, do what you want, I can help you. Um, you can live in the house, call the undertaker and take Alma's uh, body back home, which she does. When she is back in, in Kentucky, Harry Belchick will come and, um, and tutor her. And in math, and he loves her. Watch this juxtaposition. He loves her, and finally, they they do become uh, lovers. But Beth then, after their liaison in bed, goes directly to read chess books. And look how that's mirrored later on in the novel and in the series when she's in bed with Benny and really feels something and says, this is how it should feel. And Benny then looks at her as a, press ch a, a chess prodigy and says, um, this is what you should do when you're going to Paris or when you're going to Moscow. And she's very disappointed. When she has the house, she will tear apart the 1950s kind of decor that is there and introduce modern um, furniture, a rock like poster in, the, in her home. She will plant a garden and she seems to be getting well until she runs out of food and she goes to a restaurant and she hears a chanteuse with a pianist who reminds her of her mother singing about the idea of she cannot find love. Then she will order a Gibson, her mother's drink, and she will go on a bender. Harry tries to help, it doesn't help, and Jolene comes back into the picture. And Jolene now is, it's in the 60s, she is a, a, a modern young woman with a, an Afro, she's going to study to be a, a lawyer, and she says to, um, to, to Beth, 
we have you have to pull yourself together you can do this you are not your mother i have a gym we are working out and she resurrects her really physically and mentally when we talk about the series there there is no you are my guardian angel speech that is put in uh later beth will go to paris and once again she is defeated by borges when she comes home, she doesn't go back to Benny for some tutoring. She will go on the spender and then be rescued by Jolene. She is going to go to be a world champion in, in, in Moscow, and she's going to play Borgov there. And she needs money. And that's where the Christian crusade ladies do come. And they say, we want you to beat the Russians for Jesus. And we need you to make a statement to the world. And, and Beth says, no way, you know, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. I am not going to carry on this crusade, literally and figuratively. I'm going to give you back your money, which she does. And then somehow she will get money and uh, through the Fe Chess Federation, and then we'll be given a handler from the cultural attache, but it may not be the cultural attache, it may be somebody from the CIA named Booth, who will go to her with Moscow, she goes alone, T.L. Towns does not go with her, that's strictly romance by, by Netflix. Um, However, she will be tutored by Benny and her chess family who are back in New York. The real beautiful part of this novel before she beats Borgoff is her match with Luchenko. If you remember Luchenko from the Netflix, he looks like a wild uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein. But look what he does. He's really a repetition of Mr. Scheibel. Um, he, he loses and he says to her with, with such dignity and passion, he bows and he says to her, you are astounding, my dear, which echoes the confidence that Mr. Scheibel gave her. You may be the best chess player I have ever met. And with that confidence, and we're all saying, hooray, we know she's going to go on to beat Borgov. And it's very interesting to see that throughout the novel, Borgov is very well aware he's getting older and that Beth Harmon is somebody to be reckoned with. He says in the novel, don't underestimate her. She is an orphan. And as an orphan, she's a survivor like the rest of us. He has a team around her, uh, him to help with his game, and she will have a team by phone in Moscow to help with her game, but it's very interesting. Benny and the group will give her strategies, right? But Borgoff does not play the strategy that they anticipate. And so she looks on the ceiling again, it's her vision, and she will intuitively know the right play. It's not the boys who tell her. She herself will, will win. And look at Borgoff. Borgoff hands her his, the, the queen and says to her, this is your game, take it. In the novel, she just marches outside in Moscow and everyone is celebrating her because chess in the USSR is their football, their baseball, their soccer. And she will walk into the garden and the park where the older men are playing. And an old man who looks very, very familiar, he looks like William Schnabel, Schnabel says, will you play? It is he who invites her. And there we see the line that is played throughout this novel, that chess is not only a competitive game, Beth will say, chess is a beautiful game and it is the beauty and the sheer joy of playing that she will and uh, play with the men in the park and then we have this enigmatic ending does she stay in russia does she go home and we don't know that answer 
it, it's an enigma even in the series. But I will tell you what the actors have to say, and then you tell me what you have to think. So we have 253 pages of print on the page. How are we going to turn that into seven episodes of a Netflix series? Okay, so what are the elements that we need? We need actors. We need cinematographers. We need costumes and makeup. We need music. We, we need settings. We need everything that brings the book visually to life. And if you watch the series again, which I hope you will, watch how each of the seven series is introduced by a mini prologue. There is an introduction for instance, in the first series, there's a knock, 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 knock. It's a blank, black screen and a knock, knock, knock at a door in the Paris tournament. And someone is saying, uh, Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle, vous êtes là? Are you awake? And we see Beth Harmon crawling out of, a, of the bathtub because she has been seduced by Cleo, who never has a is not a character at all in the novel. That's one of the ways that they differentiate. And uh, she is dressed in a green and white dress that mimics the look of a pill because she's taken the pills, she's drinking alcohol, she is running out the door. Look at all the doors. Look at all the doors in this series from the doors in the orphanage to the doors in the um, in her home to the doors in all the tournaments. She is walking through these doors to different aspects and phases of, of her life. She will meet uh, Borgov. She will look into his eyes and then all the flashbacks begin of the story. So look at the introduction. It's a few minutes of introduction. And for the series, they are going to fill in the backstory through all these introductions of Alice Harmon, her mother. We are going to see Alice was once a genius mathematician from Cornell. Um, she doesn't know what to do with her daughter. She is left by her husband. She is mentally ill. The young girl who plays um, Beth at five and, and then uh, before she's 14 is always worried her mother's going to disappear. But her mother says, you are a problem. I don't know how to solve it. And we understand the mother has intentionally um, crashed the car into the truck uh, which is not stated in the novel, and the little girl is left to be um, an orphan. We're going to talk about the, the actors and, uh, in this that are very important, but I think you would like to know about the settings. Every, there are two places where this series is filmed. One of them is Berlin, and the other is Canada. Everything you see, whether it is Vegas, whether it is Paris, whether it is Moscow, it has all been filmed in Berlin and the environs of Berlin because the architecture lends itself and the set direction is absolutely magnificent. Everything that took place in Lexington, Kentucky, including the apple pie girls who snub um, our heroine uh, because she doesn't have the right clothes or the saddle shoes takes place in Canada, either Ontario or Toronto. And so the set direction tells us uh, that. The cinematography is wonderful. And watch the, can the, the angles of the camera. It's not the chest pieces and, and tournaments themselves are real chess tournaments that people have played, but it's the angles. You're looking at the faces of these people close up. You're looking at the choreography of their hands. It is their inner emotions that compel us to keep watching the, the, this series. So the cinematography is wonderful. The costumes, look how the costumes age Beth from the time she's in a pinafore and jumper to the time she is in a jumper and, and 
the wrong kinds of clothes to the time she's sophisticated and is interested in clothes and buys her own saddle shoes and then often pa Parisian. Look how her hair changes, wigs from the little girl to the little flip to the page boy to everything to the her redhead she had to be a redhead because the woman who plays her um anya taylor joy who is magnificent and keeps the series together says i knew that that beth had to be a redhead because we had to pick her out from all the crowds but more than that it mirrors her fire inside her anger and her personality um the, the the music is beautiful you will hear eric satie's pieces played by alma the, the 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 music director wanted only the piano to play but he introduces strings and flutes and crescendos when they're playing and the matches are so dramatic the music becomes dramatic so all of these things play a role but let's talk about the major things the actors i want to talk to you about anna taylor joy she read the script she said i had to play this woman i am this young girl who matures comes of age and finds her own agency um I am a dancer as well as an actor, and I love the choreography of chess. By the way, all of the chess players, the, the young people who are playing these chess competitors have never played chess in their lives. It is all choreographed, and the people who are playing with them are chess masters themselves and have helped them learn uh, chess. Mr. Schauble is played by Bill Camp, and he seems gruff, but we know that he loves uh, Alma. Mary Le Marielle Heller is loves Beth, is um, Alma Wheatley, and she's interesting because she's the director. She directed the um, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, but she was called back by um, Frank Scott to play Alma, and she said, Alma is a complicated woman, and I enjoyed playing her. Moses Ingram played Jolene. This was the breakout role for Jolene. And she said, I love the part because it's a period piece. And um, um, I, I liked being the big sister. And I also liked representing the coming of age of a black woman as well, from the pigtailed woman to the Afro woman to the agency woman. And that was important uh, to her. Benny is played by Thomas Brody Snyder, and I think he's a compelling character. Um, Harry Beltic is played by Harry Melling. And um, J Jacob Forbes Lloyd is DL Towns. And because Netflix wants, a, wants to have him come back, he comes back in the Moscow setting. He becomes her friend and her uh, advocate. And it is he who calls Benny together. They also have a rapprochement. He says to her, I know that when we were in Vegas, you were looking to me to perhaps love you. And I was confused myself, and they forgive one another. Um, Millie Brody is Cleo. Why is Cleo in the in the series and not in the book? Because Netflix wants to drive home this idea of the cold world and that um, America, the States is very um, involved in defeating the, US, the Russians at their own game. And who is Cleo? We don't know. She's a chameleon. And it is she who seduces uh, Beth out of her room in Paris and gets her drunk. And therefore, she loses to Borgov. So we don't know really who she is and what she represents. And she's introduced at Benny's home, and she's also introduced in um, Paris. The, a, a very um, Polish actor named Vasily Borgov plays uh, 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 Marcin Dolinsky plays uh, Vashley Borgov. And I think through his facial actions, 
we begin to see uh, to see who he is. And at the end, in the in the Netflix series, she walks out as the White Queen, all in white. Her her blouse, her shoes, her her um, coat, and her hat. She is the White Queen personified. She's in the car with her handler, and she says, "Stop the car." She walks out into the garden where the men are all there, and it is she who has the last word in the series. It is she who says to the man, um, the older man, let's play. And she says it in Russian. The other thing I want you to look for in this series is how the chessboard is repeated in all of the costumes. It is repeated on the bedclothes. It is repeated on the rugs. It is repeated in the clothing that Beth wears. And so you will see the chessboard all over. In fact, there is a pillow in the corner of Benny's apartment that is black and white in checkers. So there are visual cues. There's a symbol of time with the watch. There are expressions of people. And it is absolutely beautifully done. I'm going to quickly tell you, because this is sponsored by Meet, what the nine facts are about uh, the show. But uh, if you go back, and I think it's well worth looking again at the Queen's Gambit to see the visual cues, the costuming, the music, the actors, the settings, how they bring this book to life. The first thing is that Scott Frank is Jewish. He's the co-director, the co-writer of the series. He um, also introduces the idea of Yehudi Halevi, the Jewish poet and philosopher, in one other of his series called Godless. Number two, the series is shot in Berlin. And if you look at the exterior of the orphanage, it is an estate that was once owned by the Israel family. They were philanthropists, they were big retail magnets, and they lost that home during the Second World War. It was taken over by the Nazis. The family parents perished in the camps. The children did escape. Marielle Heller, who plays Alma Wheatley, has a Jewish father, but more than that, the connection is that when she was filming A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, she went to Pittsburgh. She put her son in the JCC. The day after her filming wrapped was the day that there was the shooting at the Tree of Life synagogue. The fourth, in the fourth episode, Harry Beltic talks about two Jewish chess players who played blindfolded. There were number five, two Jewish dress, uh, chess players popularized the opening move of the Queen's Gambit. Bobby Fischer is certainly somebody that um, William Tevis had in mind. In fact, Alma at one point slips in Mexico and says to Beth, what about your friend Bobby? And she says, you don't mean Bobby, you mean Benny. But the Bobby refers to Bobby Fisher. Um, seventh is that uh, Beth Harmon has a real life um, chess player partner. Her name is Judith Poljar. And if you go on to YouTube, both um, uh, Anya Taylor Joy is talking to Judith Poljar, who is a um, Hungarian Jew, who was one of the first women to play an immense tournament, was a world master. She watched the show and she said, exactly, this, uh, th this anti-women playing in chess was very much a part of my world. And I, like Beth, had to fight for everything I got. Um, Gary Kasparov has a Jewish father. He is one of the um, consultants on that taught the kids how to play chess. And the last thing is closer to home. There's a woman named Jennifer Shahid, who is a grandmaster. Her mother is uh, Sally Solomon, who taught chemistry at um, Drexel. 
Although her father is Lebanese, Jennifer uh, Shahid herself went on many birthright Israel trips. And most importantly, during the pandemic, she started uh, chess tournament clubs for women. So there is the Jewish tie-in. This book and the series um, has touched a lot of hearts and heads. And I think it, it, it's the resilience that um, is shown throughout that captures our imagination, plus the, the novel itself, its themes, and how they brought this novel to life. So thank you very much. And I'm very eager to know why you enjoyed The Queen's Gambit. So thank you. And Sarah, take it away. If we have questions. Thank you so much, Bev. As usual, you are a phenomenal book reviewer and TV and film reviewer. I'll start with what chats I see so far and people please feel free to keep on typing. Uh, Ruth asks, wasn't Chloe a spy? Yes, the belief is that Chloe is a spy and that perhaps she's sent by the KGB to seduce um, uh, Beth, so with liquor and sex so that she can't win. But it's never explicit. We're reading between the lines. But that's, I believe that's why she's brought into the series, although she's not in the novel. And David says, uh, as was tweeted by Lahav Harkov regarding episode five, were there a lot of Jews in Lexington, Kentucky in the 60s that made the set designers of the Queen's Gambit decide the drugstore should sell Kedem grape juice? <laughs> I, I noticed that too, and I was laughing when I saw that. You know, not only Kedem uh, grape juice, but it, it was a way of saying this is what was sold in the 60s, and whether or not, like, because they had Morton Salt there as well, and they had the magazines there as well, I think it was a way of of placing a timeline, but it also could be that Lexicon Tadaki had a number of Jews. I'm not sure myself. Yeah, I was like, look, Josh, when I was yeah. watching it. Look at that. Um, so I don't see any more comments here, actually. Um, so may I make a comment, even though sure. I'm the Q&A yeah, moderate? I, I want to highlight that um, when I was watching it, I couldn't separate my uh, meat brain from what I was watching. And I, be, many years ago, I was a volunteer for Big Brothers, Big Sisters of New York City. And um, I, I really felt the power of those few moments in her life, of Beth Harmon's life, when someone just took a moment and said, hey kid, like you're okay. And it just made me think like, that simple thing that we do for our kids and that our parents did for us and those thousands of kids out there like Beth, like the Amit children, like any unlucky kid who doesn't have that moment in life. You know, she had all that talent that wasn't given to her by anyone, but she needed that little bit of support to just push her forward or she would have gone down a terrible spiral. And I, I just want to highlight that connection since no one else wrote any questions. Oh, wow. I, it is really huge. Yeah, I think so. And the other thing I love, this humor here as well. Do you remember when she's playing Borgoff and she looks up at the ceiling? She has everybody else looking up at the ceiling. They can't see what she sees. She's visualizing the chessboard because it's only her ability and her vision um, that she will see in her mind the right way to play. So there is humor sprinkled out. Uh, throughout this as as well. The other theme is, you know, does does genius border on madness? And that comes throughout the novel as well. You, her mother um, was a genius in many ways in math, but was mentally ill. We had um, Benny say to her, read about this 
grand master, he also went mad. And Harry Belchick says to her, you know, you are so obsessed with chess that I'm worried about you. And the reporter from Life magazine says to her um, that genius borders on psychosis. So some of the tension and the reason we watch is we're rooting for Beth. We want to know, is she going not only to survive, but triumph? Or is she, as Sarah says, going down a spiral? And I think the actors are wonderful. Um, uh, Anya uh, Taylor-Joy won the Golden Globe as best actress in a, in, a Netflix, in a series. The Netflix series won the Golden Globe for the limited series on television. Um, I think it just was a compelling uh, story. It was a beautiful set and costumes. The music was wonderful. The cinematography was wonderful. And the settings. I mean, when I read that this was only in Berlin and Ontario, you know, my respect for the production <laughs> rose 127%. Uh, Stan asked, why did Beth never visit or acknowledge Mr. Scheibel before her visit to the orphanage and awareness of his death? Um, because she never wanted to go back. That's really very important. Thank you for bringing that up. She really didn't want to go back. And the reason that Jolene comes to say he died, she says, I never wanted to walk into that orphanage again. However, once she is at, this, at the funeral and there's so few people there and they're making a mockery of him through the eulogy, she says to Jolene, we're going to go back. And as she walks down the steps and she is replaying in her mind about uh, William Scheibel, she sees the bulletin board and the scrapbook that he has kept, the scrapbook on the bulletin board, it shows her from the little girl with him. You know, she goes from a pawn to a queen in this series. And that's what the bulletin board does for us. We see her as this little girl dressed with him and he has followed her career through pictures and she understands how much he, she was loved and she cries at that point. It is a catharsis for her. But once she leaves the orphanage, she doesn't want to go back. And then she is a tribute. And the Netflix tribute is take a look at the face of the supposedly Russian man who is playing in the park and see if he does not resemble William Scheibel. Okay, a few more questions have come in. Uh, Jeff asks, do we think there will be a sequel? The book ends with pointing out the world championship will be in two years. Yes, it's a limited series. They do not think there'll be a sequel. My question to you is, what did you think about the ending? You, what, what did you say? But no, that to date, there will not be a second series, although all the actors are willing to do it. It was a limited series. We leave Beth at a very good place and they're not going to revisit it. Tell me what people thought about the ending. You can make up your own ending. Anybody, I'll meet people. Does she go back or doesn't she? Well, I'll tell you what they say. The actors say, no, that this is, this is Beth's moment in the sun. It is her lap of victory. It's where she can be herself playing for the joy in Russia. But they all believe that she's going to go back to the States because she has a family there. She has Benny and the other people and that they don't believe she's going to defect, defect to, <laughs> to, to Russia. But that's up to you. It's open ended and you can decide. So, okay, I'm going to keep reading questions. And if anyone wants to speak up, unmute yourself, please. Okay, so David asks, uh, would you consider that the original novel was as good as the Netflix series? 
I think as, as we were talking about this before, I think that the novel is, is a compelling novel and you can use your imagination to flesh out these, these characters. And I think the themes are, are beautifully portrayed. What brings it to life is, is the visual elements in, in Netflix. So I think that they complement each other. I think it is a worthwhile novel. You should run out to your independent bookstores and buy The Queen's Gambit uh, by Walter Tevis. And you, you can compare for yourself. I think what makes the Netflix so compelling is, is everything that we've talked about before and a few things that they have introduced that's different to bring it home, which is, which is mostly Cleo, that, uh, that Towns does not appear three times, that Jolene, this, this conversation she has where she says, the, Beth says to her, you're my guardian angel. And Jolene says, I can't even rescue myself. I can't even rescue you. You must rescue yourself. That's not in at all. So I think they complement each other. Um, and so if you enjoyed the series, you should read the novel. A few people put in their thoughts um, to your question. So I'll read you a couple of them. Uh, Jeff says that uh, he thinks the ending is more allegorical than it is literal. Okay. Good. And Sherry and Mel say that the last scene showed that chess could also be fun for Beth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Beth asks, hang on, I have to scroll. Okay. Uh, Beth says that one thing that stood out to her was how she finally stood up to her adoptive father after her mom dies when he comes looking for money. How do you think this relates to her chess playing? I think it relates to her, her agency, the gaining of the self-confidence in her life. When Austin, Austin originally says in the novel, uh, as in the uh, series, you can live in the house, just play the mortgage. But then he comes back to say, I'm going to sell the house. I need the money. He's a no good Nick throughout this whole thing. Um, and she stands up to him and says, no way. I am. I will give you the seven thousand dollars, but I'm going to subtract the money that it cost to bury mother. And so she is beginning to assert herself. And it also makes Austin an even more villainous character than we saw before. And and watch, you know, when he comes in, when he's sitting, he's a little higher than she is. And then when she challenges him, she sits a little higher than he does. I mean, it's fascinating to see these visual cues. Okay, what needs to be noted is that chess in the tournament is different in style and purpose versus chess in the park. Yes. Absolutely. And, um, and, and chess in the park is the sheer joy of playing, right? Chess in the tournament is competitive. And all those games in the major tournaments are based on real chess matches. The other thing to watch, Beth is usually the, uh, playing the black pieces because black goes second. But when she's with Borgoff in the final chess game, she is white and she goes first. And that's why she is the white queen. So we see her maturing not only in chess, but in life and in self. And it's just wonderful, my dears. <laughs> it's a wonderful book and series. And I, uh, I can understand why millions of people have tuned in. Yes, you're making me want to go back and rewatch it, and I probably will. Okay. Great fashions, you know, uh, great 50s and 60s uh, furnishings. Those of us who can remember the pop songs that are being played as part of the music, I mean, they really do make you feel that time and place is real. And the watch that her mother gives her, um, when she has a bender, stops, you know? The other thing to listen for, throughout the seven series, you hear the tapping of the clock on the chess clock, 
and that is also the marking of time throughout the throughout the novel and throughout. So we thank you for for tuning in. Anybody else who wants to stay, we'll be glad to talk about it. Um, in my way, I am, because Sarah says I can. I wish everybody a Zisa Pesach, a sweet and happy and healthy Passover and an abundant spring. And Sarah's going to do it as well. But thank you all for, for supporting us and for being here tonight. I truly appreciate it. Sarah? Thank you so much, Bev. Uh, so in a moment, um, Israel is going to put up on screen our upcoming events, and I'll read them off, off to you. So first of all, reiterating, Bev, how we love your presentations, and thank you so much. Um, and so we've got tomorrow. Our next event is tomorrow, Thursday, uh, say 8.30 p.m. instead of 8, which we started tonight. Um, and it's a part two of a three-part series that we've called Lens on Israel. It's the looking at Israeli society through its own cinema. Tomorrow's lecture will discuss the difficult topics of immigration, um, absorption, and assimilation. And then right after Passover, uh, Tuesday, April 6th, um, is Yom HaShoah. And we will be presenting a book called In Their Own Words. Um, 52 personal stories, oh, sorry, it's called How We Survived, 52 personal stories by child survivors of the Holocaust, and they will, a few people will be on presenting in their own words, uh, their stories of survival. Uh, and then uh, the week after that, we actually have a guest, Hadassah Lieberman, which is quite an honor, and she will be discussing her newly published memoir called Hadassah. Um, an American story. It's her own story uh, from an immigrant child to life in the White House. Um, and then, next screen, uh, I'd like to also tell you that tonight was the first of a three-part series which will be hosted by Bev. Um, tonight, obviously, was the Queen's Gambit. On Thursday, April 22nd, we, Bev will be leading the discussion and comparison of uh, the book called A Woman of No, of no Importance, it is a nonfiction book, and the smaller name of it is um, A Woman of No Importance, The Untold Story of an American Spy. And the film adaptation of this true story is called A Call to Spy, and you can get it on Amazon Prime. And then on Thursday, May 20th, another nonfiction, The Angel, The Egyptian Spy Who Saved Israel, and I believe the film and the book have the same title. Uh, so if you want some good reading over the Passover week, get those books and then watch the movies. And we look forward to seeing you either tomorrow night or in April or both. And myself and Robbie, Israela, all the Amit staff who are here wish you a wonderful, wonderful Pesach, Passover, however you say it, a wonderful spring. And we thank you for joining us tonight and at all of our virtual events. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Good night.